This scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, slander, and envy of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but, those, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are the words of the Lord. And thanks be to God for his words. Let us pray. Father, we like to thank you that you gather us this Thanksgiving Sunday, and we are very grateful to you once again um, as we begin to make some sense to this passage that Ian has read with us and for us. Uh, we like to thank you for these words, Lord, and we pray that um, as we consider these words, that your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts and touch our hearts uh, so that we will receive a word from you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the people said, Amen. Peter writes to people who are persecuted for their faith. Whether it is the local Roman authorities, their slave masters, or their unbelieving spouses, Peter's readers suffer grief in all kinds of trouble. Can we survive this crisis. This is their cry. They receive all kinds of negative comments and discrimination for their faith. Life is fragile, but Peter reminds them that there is one hope for them. And so at the end of 1 Peter chapter 1, he says these words, for all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. First Peter 1, 24 to 25. Most of Peter's readers do not grow up in a Jewish household who have the Torah or the Old Testament read to them. Most of Peter's readers come from a non-Jewish pagan background. They are biblically illiterate. Therefore, Peter's letter to them is very precious. Every Sunday when they meet, they hear this letter being read to them by the leaders of their church. And so why is this so important for them? It is important because they feel that as they hear Peter's words, they sense that these words are from God. And the words from God endure forever. 
The grass withers and the flowers fall, but God's words to them endure forever. God speaks to them through the words of Peter's letter. First Peter 2, 2 to 3. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So most of these readers of Peter's letter are new believers in Jesus Christ. Peter advises them to grow slowly in their faith. Do not expect to know everything about your faith immediately. Take baby steps. Read the Bible like you are newborn babies taking in the milk. It is not mere reading. It is pondering through the words of this letter as we read them to you. It is developing your relationship with the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. However, there is one reality facing these first century Christians. Jesus Christ is not exactly a much loved figure. To start with, Jesus dies on a cross. The cross is the most shameful way of dying in the Roman Empire. The cross is reserved for the most extreme and violent, violent of criminals. All those who put their trust in Jesus know that they are following the path of a person who was put on the cross. And so people are most likely to reject Jesus rather than to accept him when they hear of the good news. So this is what Peter says about Jesus, the living stone. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone that causes people to stumble and the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Peter reminds them of the great risks they face when they follow Jesus. Uh, they are persecuted because people all around them reject Jesus. Jesus is the scandal. Jesus is the stone that causes people to stumble and the rock that makes them fall. There is no respectability in following Jesus in the first century. Following Jesus in the first century is a scandal. The actors Brad Pitt and Hugh Jackman both grew up in Christian homes, but both men have since distanced themselves from the faith of their childhood. Here's how Brad Pitt describes his spiritual journey. I found my Christian upbringing very stifling. I always had a lot of questions about the world, even in kindergarten. A big question to me was fairness. If I'd grown up in some other religion, would I get the same shot at heaven as a Christian has? When I got unfettered from the comfort of religion, it, was a it wasn't a loss of faith for me. It was the discovery of self. I had faith that I'm capable enough to handle any situation, there's peace in understanding that I have only one life here and now, and I'm responsible. So that's Brad Pitt's words about the faith of his upbringing. Hugh Jackman grew up in a deeply religious family in Australia. His parents having been converted to faith through Billy Graham. But in a 2013 interview, Jackman said this, I was involved with so many things in the church. It was my social group. Um, it was where I met girls. It was my sort of life out of school. Then around 16 or 17, I started questioning, how come all these non-believers are going to hell? The same interview reported, today Jackman is not particularly religious and says that he never prays. Though he believes in some form of God and afterlife and meditates twice daily for 30 minutes, Jackman said, it is about quieting that part of the brain and just seeing and being. So both Brad Pitt and Hugh Jackman grew up in church communities. However, later in life, they rejected the culture of the church communities 
they grew up in. They see a difference between life in the church community and life outside the church community. However, Peter here tells his readers that faith is more than the religious culture that they grew up in. It is about following Jesus. Peter's readers have decided to follow Jesus. And who is this Jesus? The stone that causes people to stumble and the rock that makes them fall. The scandal is not the religious culture of their upbringing. The scandal is Jesus. People feel threatened by Jesus. And that's why they persecuted the believers of Jesus Christ. And the reality that Peter's readers are all struggling with is that people all around them reject Jesus and make life difficult for them. So this is how Peter describes the faith of his readers. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 4-5. So Peter, Petros in Greek, whose name means rock, calls Jesus the living stone. The living stone. So why does Petros or Peter call Jesus the living stone? To start with, the word stone or rock carries the idea of something hard, solid, and dependable. Peter tells his readers that in times of change and fragility, Jesus is the living stone upon whom they can stand on. This living stone is rejected by human beings, but chosen by God and is precious to him. He, uh, this living stone um, is precious. God chooses Jesus. Jesus is precious to God. God guarantees the durability and the dependability of Jesus. And then later, Peter goes on to say this. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6, quoting Isaiah 28. So when we go to a new subdivision of land, where there are houses being built, uh, we see that solid concrete must be laid in the ground first um, before any structure can be built on it. And if there is no solid foundation stone, the final product, the house, will not be safe to live in. Cracks will appear on the wall. So Peter calls Jesus the chosen and precious cornerstone the solid concrete portion that must be laid down first before they can build their lives around this solid foundation. So Peter reminds them that Jesus alone is their strength and shield. It is to Jesus alone that their spirits yield. So after the laying of the foundation stone, the frame is built on it. That means more stones and brick are added to the frame, so the, build, the house is built from the basement up to the top floor. A house emerges from this cornerstone. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. First Peter 2 verse 5 again. This main living stone, Jesus, brings smaller stones to himself. These little living stones make up the spiritual house, a holy priesthood who offers sacrifices up to God. And Peter reminds them that their sacrifices are only acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. They have no merit to stand before the holy God. It is only the living stone Jesus who brings them to God. Jesus is the one who makes them the little living stones. I have often said this about church life. The church is the people and not the steeple. The church is not the building. The church is not the programs 
that occur in the church facility. The church is not the pews. The church is the people who sit on the pews. The church is the people who not only sit on the pews now, but the church is also those people who are not seated on the pews, but who are connected online at home. So, whether we are on the pews, or whether we are in our living rooms or kitchens now, we are the church. We are the little living stones built on the main living stone. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So this Thanksgiving weekend is going to be different from the past Thanksgiving weekends. This is because of COVID-19. Due to the new health guidelines, there is a possibility that not everyone can be present at the Thanksgiving dinner this year. Thanksgiving dinners this weekend are going to be much smaller than usual. As you know, every summer, I usually go back to Malaysia. I visit dad, my brother, and his family. However, this year, because of the coronavirus, I couldn't make that trip back to Malaysia. Now, I am still grateful that I can connect with dad by phone every Monday night. Um, however, it is not vis the same as visiting dad in the house I grew up in and eating the food I grew up with. However, I am thankful that dad is safe from the virus. God is looking after my family, whether in Malaysia or here in Ontario. And I pray that God continues to keep all of us safe from the virus. And I pray that God continues to keep not only us safe from the virus, but all our families extended from us. May God cast His Holy Spirit to keep us safe from the Holy Spirit, from the virus. It might be a smaller Thanksgiving family celebration this year, but we are thankful to God for keeping us safe. Uh, recently, I got to meet someone who is a friend of a relative in a family birthday celebration. I'm going to call him Jim. We started talking about our families and how we have been keeping ourselves safe from the virus. Uh, Jim originally comes from Alberta and still has family in Alberta. Uh, Jim tells me that he also has family in Ontario. And so in the past, during the family events uh, in Ontario, the last thing they do is to connect online with the family from Alberta. However, because of this coronavirus, um, they have been made familiar with the use of technology online. And so right now, first of all, for, right now, Jim is going to have a Thanksgiving dinner with people within his social bubble, bubble in his family. However, when they have their family dinner this Thanksgiving weekend, Jim tells me that they're going to connect online with the family in Alberta. And while they're having their Thanksgiving dinner in Ontario, and it might be three hours earlier than the Thanksgiving dinner in Alberta, uh, they will still connect with each other online. And Jim tells me that if it were not for the coronavirus, they would have never thought of connecting their family dinners in Ontario with the family in Alberta. God opens the door for Jim's family to connect, whether they meet in Ontario or in Alberta. And God, during this crisis, helps us discover new ways of connecting with each other, friend or family, even though we might be far away from each other. So here in 1 Peter, Peter is in Rome. Uh, his readers are in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This is northern Turkey today. Whether they are in Rome or in northern Turkey, 
Peter reminds them that they are all little living stones connected to the main living stone, Jesus. The church is the people, not the steeple. Whether they are in Rome or in northern Turkey, they are the people of God. They belong to God. We belong to God. Our families belong to God. And they are thankful for this connection with God and the others, even though they might be far away from each other. So in, at the end of the passage, Yen read with us and for us this morning, this is the quotation that I'm going to end with. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so, Father, we just like to thank you for the blessings of life. As we uh, think through the words of First Peter chapter two verses one to ten, and we like to thank you, Lord, that you have made us a people, even though once we were not a people, you have made us the people of God. And it doesn't matter whether we are in Malaysia or whether we are in Alberta or whether we are here in Mississauga, you claim us for yourself, and you make us the people of God. And so, Lord, our relationship with people in our families and in, with our friends is more than the Thanksgiving meal. We are connected by the reality that God has made us a people for himself. We belong to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us cherish that this Thanksgiving weekend, which is so challenging compared to the Thanksgiving weekend's of the past. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we're going to...